Hey, you just tapped and dropped in one of the most amazing sermons on the net today. Welcome to CNBC. Get ready to have your spirit uplifted and prepare to dive into God's Word. Enjoy today's broadcast. The pure in heart. Part of the Beatitudes. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, you'll find the whole list of Beatitudes. I've been preaching from them for the last few weeks. And the concept of the purity of our heart. There's a lot to that. When I worked in the disaster relief down in New Orleans, after we had gone to Mississippi, Laurel, Mississippi, after uh, Katrina had hit, we went to New Orleans to help restore some homes. Part of our job and task was to set up down at uh, Gentilly, the First Baptist Church of Gentilly, to set up shelving in there because the mission teams were going to come down and use that church, which was a defunct church at that time. They were going to use that building to basically operate the mission projects out of. Well, what happened was that because of that operation, that church came back alive and literally is serving now the community of Gentile on a full-time basis. One of the issues that we had was water. One of the first things that we find in disaster relief is there's always a great need of fresh water. Now, a lot of the companies like Coke and some others immediately bottle fresh water or can it, put it in the cans. I've never drank in canned water, but, <laughs> but it's pretty neat that they will do that and send that in big lots down to the area where the disaster is. Well, they hadn't quite started doing that at the time that we were in Gentile, but one of the disaster relief groups brought in on a trailer a distiller, a purifier for water. And I asked the guy, I said, well, just how good is this? And he stuck the hose down there in the midst of a bunch of water there on the ground, sucked it up, and 10 minutes later, we had pure water. It had cleaned all of the mud, all of the germs, all of the contamination out by that process of that distiller. They had taken muddy water and made pure water. It's amazing to see that happen. But the truth is, my friends, that's what Jesus does with our lives. He takes our muddy lives and runs it through his distillation of salvation and makes us into the purity that we need to be. So what does it mean to be pure in heart? Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Now that word see means they shall understand God. They shall have an insight into God. Because they are striving for a purity in their life. To be pure is a process. As I watched that purification machine, I told you it took a little while, but there was a process by which it had to go through and filtration process to bring out that pure water. Well, we Christians have to go that way also. We are not immediately made pure. It's a process. We call it sanctification. And sanctification can be hard sometimes. I told my wife, I really didn't want to preach this message this morning because of what are the, some of the things I'm going to reveal to you. You're not going to like it. So if it steps on your toes, I want you to know it's already stepped on me all over the place because I didn't like some of the things. But we're going to look at it. The result of the Christian life is that they live holy and pure. This purity begins within the heart, but will show eventually outwardly. 
Where do we start? We start, first of all, with a pure conversation. In Psalms 19, verse 14, it says this, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Average people speaks 18,000 words daily. Ladies, add a few more. They're supposed to be able to speak 25,000 daily. But are all our words acceptable to God? I had an English teacher named Miss King. She was one of our great teachers. Mary and I got sent to the office because we did PDA in the hallway for Miss King. We were holding hands. The only thing is, it was behind her door at her classroom. And she immediately sent us to the office. But Miss King was given a lecture on basic English. She said, do you realize that the vocabulary of the average American person is over 355,000 words? Of that, the slang and the offensive words make up less than 500. She said, what do you think it shows of your intelligence if you use those 500 more than the 350,000? Makes you think, doesn't it? If we are constantly using words that are unacceptable, what does that show about us to the world? Words that are offensive. Words that take God's name in vain. Words that hurt others. Words that are false. Words that are accusatory instead of encouraging. What does it mean for us to have acceptable words? It means for us to clean up our language. It means for us to be careful what we say in the presence of others as well as ourselves. Just because there's nobody else around doesn't mean that you can just let out a long line of curse words because there is somebody still listening. And he's on his throne. I had one pastor tell uh, in a sermon one time, and it caught my eye and caught my ear real well. He said, do you realize that when you use the word GD that you are causing the head of the Almighty God to turn and to look at you? To create an action? What are our acceptable words? Controlling the tongue. James says, if anyone among you thinks he is religious, catch that, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Vain, empty religion, useless, if the tongue is not controlled. I want you to be more than religious. I want you to be Christian. There's a lot of religions out there, folks. Christianity is one of them. But the basic tenets of our faith teach us to be so different that we stand out among the religions. You see, we serve a risen Savior. All the other religions that are out there, I can take you to where their graves are of the tenets of their faith. The ones who developed their religion. I can show you where their graves are. And they haven't resurrected. They're still there. But we believe in a risen Lord. And he says to us, watch what you say. Control your tongue. The tongue has probably 
done more damage to churches than anything else. An uncontrolled tongue can destroy congregations as well as families. Speak what you mean. Mean what you say. In Matthew 5, 37, it says, But let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than this is from the evil one. Be honest in what we speak. Don't say one thing and do another. That's hypocritical. I caught my dad on that one time when he caught me smoking up in the hayloft. Dad smoked all his life. And I told him, I said, well, Dad, you're smoking. He says, you do what I tell you, not what I do. I said, wait a minute. Something wrong here. Let's be honest. If we agree to do something, we need to do it. Whether you sign it as a paper contract or not, a man's word is only as good as his action. We need to speak what we mean. Never use double language. That is lying. We need to be swift to hear and slow to speak, according to James 1.19. It says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. That means that we need to become good listeners and think twice before we speak. Psalms 34.13 tells us, Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. We need to keep our lips and tongues from evil. Resist gossiping, lying. Keep clean our language. You see, it starts with the heart. Those things need to change in the Christian life. You are known by the way you speak, and what is inside you will come out in your speech. It comes out at usually the wrong moments, too and usually the wrong place. We need to have purity in our company. Young people, listen to me. Salvation brings purity. Over there in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If we have been changed, if we have been made new by the power of Christ, then we need to look at things totally differently. Sin and the fruits of sin have passed away. We don't need to be involved in it anymore. But the problem that we deal with is that we're in the world. But we don't have to be of the world. Once you have been born again, you belong to another kingdom. And this is no longer your home. Our world belongs to Jesus Christ, his kingdom. So we're looking for a place to be later on. So while we're in this world, we have to deal with sin. Sin and the fruits of sin, for us, should have passed away. It doesn't mean temptation's not out there, but there's nothing wrong with temptation, folks. It's giving in to temptation that the problem starts. Christians should come out from the sinners. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 says, Therefore, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I see Christians today testing the waters sometimes, sticking their little toe just the other side of being Christian, testing the waters, pushing the envelope. Let me tell you something. There's somebody who knows, somebody who's watching, and folks, those things will come back to haunt us. We need to come out from amongst the sinners. We need to be different. So different that when people see the difference in us, they'll come and ask, why are you this way? Why are you happier? Why do I see joy in your life? Why do I see a specialness about you? It's because we're different. Now, I'll guarantee you, in this world that we live in today, Difference not good, according to society. They want everybody to be the same. Matter of fact, they're working hard to become a global community. 
They want everybody to change their beliefs so that everybody can get along with each other. Folks, there won't ever be peace in this world until Jesus comes back. When he comes back and has settled all of the issues, then there will be peace. But we need to come out from amongst them. That means that we need to be careful about who our friends are because we will be uh, judged by our association with who we're with. That doesn't mean that you need to ignore lost people. Matter of fact, you need to be working towards giving them the uh, knowledge of Jesus Christ so they'll become saved. But you don't go with them to do the things they're doing. And you don't speak the way they do. And you don't act the way they do just to get them to come in to the Christian faith. You're to be different. Your difference is what will draw them, not compromising your faith. We must clean our, yourselves. Second Corinthians therefore said in 7.1, Therefore having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I was trying to think of the little black preacher that we used to listen to from Albuquerque. He was bald-headed, short. When he preached, he snapped his suspenders. But his key word was, check yourself out. We need to cleanse ourselves. How do we do that? We need to be honest with God and with ourselves about what's wrong in our lives. And we need to go to the Lord and ask forgiveness for those things and to move on and not do them again. Manuel Scott was the guy's name. Just happened to think of him. He's probably gone to heaven by now. But I never will forget him preaching that message. Check yourself out. We should stay away from the world. And 1 John 2, 17, uh, 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all this is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. He said, But the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. We need to stay away from the world. A Christian must be different from sinners. And we ought to be different so that the sinner sees the hope that we have. We need to practice holiness. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. This will bring purity of heart and life in beginning to practice being holy. I'll be honest with you. The church today is not practicing holiness. In many cases, they're practicing accommod uh, accommodation. They're trying to find a way in which they can accommodate themselves to bring people in, to grow their church bodies, to have people come in because they are doing things differently than what Christianity says. Some of those churches are growing. Yes, but they're offering people compromise to the world. Somebody said to me that we need to have an outreach program. You are the outreach program. You understand that? I am the outreach program. The Bible tells us over there in Matthew, the last chapter, go ye therefore... To all the natures and teach, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, de teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always. In Second Corinthians, or in First Corinthians, uh, five and twenty and uh, seventeen and twenty, it tells us that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We are the outreach program. We can have program after program after program by the convention, and folks, it's not going to work unless we're in working the program. And that program is that we've been called to go out to reach the lost. That's our only reason for existing. Do you know that? It's not the fellowships, it's not the food, it's not the, the, uh, the, uh, the trappings of the church, folks. The only ministry that God called the church to 
was reconciliation. And to do that, we've got to practice holiness. Because we need to have relationships to others. Christians and sinners cannot have good relationships. Amos 3, 3 says this, Can two walk together unless they are, are agreed? I had a preacher of another denomination tell me that's the reason that we can't cooperate together. It says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? That's not what that means. What that means is, can an ungodly and a godly walk together in this world? There's no agreement between the godly and the ungodly. As a matter of fact, our young people should be taught that they don't want to unequally yoke themselves with an unbeliever. That's just asking for trouble down the line. That's going to be conflict in the family immediately. Both need to know who Jesus Christ is before they enter into that union. Now, I've seen it happen where the wife has won the husband or the husband has won the wife, and praise God for that. But that's not the norm. That's of exception. We need to be pure in character as well. A pure character is honest. A person who lies will commit other sins as well. We must have a morality. Romans 6, 12 through 13 says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust, and do not present your members as instruments of a righteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Christians must maintain a high Christian standard. You know why the church is getting such a rough reputation today? Why people are criticizing and literally trying to stop Christian faith from going out is because it's challenging their morality. True Christians will challenge the morality of society. Look what we've got by allowing things to happen. By not standing for our faith and our morality. Look at the, look at the society we're living in. Folks, if it doesn't change in America, we're going to have to apologize to the Corinthians. Because in the New Testament, to be called a Corinthizer meant that you were the worst kind of person in the world. Corinth was filled with sin and degradation. There wasn't any morality there. And when they started the church there in Corinth, it was a tough go. Paul had to write four letters to them dealing with issues. You say, oh, we've only got two. There's two more that we haven't got. And he dealt with every issue that the church wrote to him about. And most of them had to do with sin, morality, the coming of Jesus, the second coming. Those were things that really blew their minds. You see, they didn't have that kind of hope before. But when the gospel comes up, we've got that kind of hope. That we don't have to worry about being here all the time. Christ is going to come and get us. Righteousness. More than a form of ritual. More than just coming to church. Coming to church shouldn't be an ordeal for a family. We ought to have the commitment that we're going to be at church. And you say, well, I can be a Christian without going to church. Uh, let me talk to you about that. The church is the body of Christ. Right? It's the body of baptized believers in Jesus Christ. Right? It's not this building. It's the fellowship of believers. If you don't want to have fellowship with the believers, what is your belief? Jesus, or Paul said, if you don't love the brethren, you don't know Christ. You should be a part of the fellowship of the brethren. I've also told some folks, it's a slap in the face of Christ to deny his bride. What do we come to church for? 
We come for fellowship. We come for encouragement. We come to grow spiritually and mentally in the Word. We come to serve in whatever capacity we can with the gifts that Jesus Christ gives us. What are you using your gifts for if you're out there in the world without being a part of the church? You can't use them effectively unless you're the part of the body. That's what they were given to you for. Lastly, our character should change our thinking as a Christian. For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. So, uh, somebody has told me, he says, well, you know, I never have committed adultery. And I ask him, did you ever think about it? Matthew 5.28 says, but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What about murder? I've never killed anyone, but I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Matthew 7, 1 through 5 says, you are not to judge. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Our thinking has to change as Christians. Our minds need to seek after the mind of Christ and to become like Him. I told you, this is a tough sermon for me because it challenges many areas in my life as it should in yours. What does it mean to be pure in heart? Before the sinner can be led to Christ, there must be a different scene in the Christian that's leading. There must be purity. There must be cleanliness. I looked at a recent Barna statistic and it was asking individuals what drew them to church, what draw them to their salvation. 84% that were asked this said that it was a friend who was a Christian that brought me to Christ. 4% said the preaching of the Word. That's why I say to you, you are the outreach program. It's when we get serious about our friends and our neighbors and those around and our desire and our heartfelt desire to see them come to Jesus Christ. There won't be revival in any church until God's people get a heart for the lost. Once we do that, once we start praying with that kind of heart, once we start thinking with that kind of understanding, and once we go out with that desire to see others become a believer, there won't be revival. We can put all kinds of programs in place. We can have a preaching event. But revival begins here in the heart of the Christian as the Holy Spirit changes us. The question we've got to ask ourselves, are we going to allow Him to change us? What does it mean to be pure in heart? Well, I know one thing. It has made me think differently. It made me understand some things that I needed to understand concerning evangelism, concerning prayer, and concerning the need for us to have compassion for the lost.
Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's my deepest desire that you know Him before you leave this place. And the Holy Spirit may be calling you to come. You come. As we sing a verse of invitation, you come. Because I want you to know the Savior. I can't save you, but He can. Thanks for joining us here today. We hope that you enjoyed the message and it made an impact in your life. Hey, you want to make sure and visit with us on the web at mycmbc.us. Also, be sure to stop by our Facebook page and follow the ministry of Crow Mountain Baptist Church. You can find it at facebook.com forward slash Crow Mountain Baptist. Tune in next week for another amazing message. Have a great week.